Colossians, and I want us to turn to um, chapter 2. We just got, we finished with chapter 1 last week, and um, we're not going to go back to 1 again. If you want to pick up with this study, it, it's on YouTube or the Facebook feed, or it's on our website, correct? So you can go visit and keep up with these studies. God is good, amen? Amen. amen. In chapter 1, Paul talks about our position in Christ. Once we become believers, we're locked in. Heaven is our home. But as we move on in Colossians, he's going to tell us how our condition needs to be improved down here. Our position is locked in, but our condition down here, if you're an honest believer, knows that we are definitely not all that God we ought to be. Amen? Amen. Thank God for Jesus. Amen? Do you need him? And we're also going to realize Paul's going to be combating heresy which people going against the Christian doctrine of the Bible and trying to add human wisdom and philosophies into the Word of God. Amen? We have to always be careful of that. That's why we need to get the true Word of God in its purest form. So let's go to Colossians 2. As long as you come here, I'm just going to teach it like it is. Real simple. God wants us to not only believe in Him, but He also wants us to walk in Him and live by what we say we believe. Amen? Our salvation is locked in. How long do we got to go there? We know that. Now we want to talk about what? Our sanctification is putting our sin nature to death from here on in. Amen? Which is the problem. All right, let's go to chapter 2 and look at verse 1. I want you to know how much I've agonized for you and for the church at Laodicea and for many other believers who have never met me personally. Paul agonized over the church because... The world was trying to get in, just like the churches today, how the world system has infected all the churches today to try to get more people to come with gimmicks and schemes instead of just letting God produce the increase Amen. by you listening to his word, becoming like him, and bringing another one to Christ. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> That's how we do it, one at a time. God's more interested in the quality of his people than the quantity. Amen? I want them to, look at verse 2, I want them to be encouraged and knit together by strong ties of love. I want them to have complete confidence that they understand God's mysterious plan, which is Christ himself. In him lie hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Look, as we grow, like I always say, always, people love to deviate from this book to try to get more wisdom and more knowledge and God is willing to reveal to you at this time in your journey. Listen, when you grow enough to understand, you will get more wisdom and knowledge. God will reveal more to you. You do not have to go outside this word for someone else to get wisdom and knowledge. Amen? Now, philosophy has its place in the world, history and all that, but it has nothing to do with our walking faith with the Lord. Jesus is all sufficient in this spiritual journey that we're on. Can I get an amen for that? That's why, as long as I'm up here, you ain't going to see me deviate from this. When God speaks to me through this word, then I'm going to speak to you. You know yeah. and what the Spirit is trying to say. And that's how he teaches us, through life. Amen? Amen. Look what it says in verse 4. I'm telling you this, so no one will deceive you with well-crafted arguments. Okay? For though I am far away from you, my heart is with you. And I rejoice that you are living as you should. See, living as you should. Look, he's not saying he's believing as you should. He's saying living as you should. Which is not talked about enough in church. We already believe it, but your actions show what you believe. The way you live shows what you believe. Can I get an amen for that? We will show you our faith by our good works. We don't stop doing it. The only thing that changes is the motivation of our heart. We do it because we love the Lord, yeah. not because we have to. And we're going to talk about this little heresy stuff. Because God told me to bring this up because the next... Uh, my, look, at, uh, for I am far from you, and I rejoice that you are living as you should, and that your faith in Christ is strong. You see, as we go on on our journey as believers, our faith in Christ starts to get weak because we want to get more and more and more and more. And he's saying, well, yeah, I'll give you more when you can actually live 
live out what I'm telling you to do now. You want more? I'll give you more. Love your enemies. Be nice to those who persecute you. Be patient in trouble. Don't worry about anything. Pray about everything. If when you start to do that and actually learn that, then more will be revealed to you. Can I get any amen for that? Amen. But no, we want deeper stuff of God. Oh, I already know all that stuff. Yeah, you know it, but do you live it? And it's going to talk about freedom from rules and a new life in Christ. See, God's trying to tell us that you can't come to him through religious activities. Okay? And that's what Paul was trying to refute because people were trying to mix this in. And I want to talk about the Colossian heresy a little bit before we go on. Okay? And this like, and I'm, I'm reading about what happened then, and I'm reading about it's happening now, still, in the churches. The heresies are filtering their way in. In Colossians, Paul answered the various tenets of the Colossian heresy. Listen now. If, you, if your heart is open and you're, you'll be listening, you'll get something very important out of this message. If your heart is on what's on TV later, you're not going to get nothing out of this. Okay? So listen, it's going to take you to focus and concentrate on what God is trying to say to the church tonight. Amen? Because it's no longer me speaking, it's God. Amen? Amen? Talking to the church. Using me as the vessel. The heresy was a mixed bag containing elements from several different heresies, some of which contradicted each other as the chart I'm going to talk about shows. The heresy, spirit is good, evil, matter is evil. Paul said God created heaven and earth for his glory. Okay? There was people out there saying only the spirit is good. The matter out there is evil. One must follow ceremonies, rituals, and restrictions in order to be saved or perfected. Not just saved, but perfected or mature. Look, they say you have to follow all these rituals if you want to mature in your faith. And Paul's answer was, these are only shadows to end in when Christ came. And he is all you need to be saved and to be perfected. All you have to do is get into the book and he will perfect you through his word and through the ministry, amen? You don't have to go outside of this. Perfection is what? Maturity. And you see people all the time, listen, I hear, I even hear people tell me about it, what they listen to, commentaries, and all these things, and all these other things that deviate from what's really in the Bible, the simplicity that's really in here, to try to find out super knowledge. Christ has all the wisdom and knowledge, and he reveals his wisdom and knowledge to each and every believer in the proper season. The problem is with believers, we're impatient. We want more, better. I, I, I've heard that before. Yeah, you've heard it before, but are you living it? Are you practicing it? Are you practicing what you're studying? Are you actually believing it and applying it to your life, or are you just using it as an empty a bag of information that causes no transformation in your life whatsoever. And you expect God to reveal more to you. It's not going to happen. So we get impatient and we go outside the Bible and to see what other people say about them verses instead of what the Bible says about the verses. What God says about them. And another heresy is one must deny the body and live in strict ascetism. Paul's answer, ascetism is no help for conquering evil thoughts, okay, and desires. Instead, it leads to pride. Oh, I've done this for so many years, but don't look at me how good I am. I haven't done that in 10 years. I denied myself that. And taking pride in it. That's not glorifying God. If you think that not doing something outwardly, changes a problem that's going on inwardly, you are being deceived. God, God loves me because I don't smoke anymore. God loves me because I stopped drinking. He loved you while you were. He don't love you anymore because you stopped. And that doesn't get you any closer to him. There's unbelievers out there that don't smoke, don't drink, don't do any kind of things outwardly, and inside they don't have Jesus. He's not the source of power. It's willpower. 
It's human power. It's fueled by the human flesh. We're complete in Christ. There's all kinds of things out there, philosophies that we're trying to mix into the church. And Paul is saying, Christ is all you need. And as long as I'm learning from the Bible, I ain't going to that philosophy crap that's out there to try to learn about Jesus because he's telling me all about him in this. I don't need to go outside of this to find out who Jesus is. And if you really want to know who Jesus is, you have to read what? The Gospels. Mm -hmm. To see how he lived down here. How he shut his mouth when people were coming at him. How he healed people didn't expect them to say thank you. He did it because he loved the Father. Like I said, you can do good acts, let somebody go, and they don't wave. How rude. You could at least say thank you. Well, then you're looking, you're doing it for the wrong reason. You're not doing it to glorify God. You're looking for recognition. Can I get any men for that? It's a different heart. What's doing one to others? Well, you know what? I'm going to let them go because I know if I was in a hurry and I'm stuck in traffic, I would want someone to let me go. So I'm going to do it. And guess what? It always comes back. Someday you'll be like, all of a sudden, somebody will let you go. and like, wow, what happened? You're just reaping what you sow. <laughs> or somebody won't let you go because you won't let anybody go because your heart got hard because they won't say thank you. But I love Jesus. Listen, having Jesus and knowing Jesus is two different things, and that's what we're going to learn about. Amen? Okay. Enough about the heresy. Let's keep talking about the Word of God here. It says, freedom from rules and new life in Christ. Look at verse 6. And now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord. Has everyone in here accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior? Okay. Now, is that all I have to do? No, it says something after that. You must continue to follow him. See it? Let your roots grow down into him and let your what? Your minds be built on him? No, let your lives be built on him. Look, our mind is built on the world system. That's going to get torn down. He wants us to live what you say you believe. Let your life be built on him. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all of the ground is sinking sand. What's the problem? We have a new foundation, but our house has been built on the world system. And he's going to tear that down for us. And that's the process of what? Sanctification, where we slowly come up out of the world and we start to do things God's way, not our way. And the situations come up every day in our lives when it's your will or God's will. How many of us have that choice? You know, that moment comes. I gave you this threat now. What are you going to do right now? My will or your will? And we fail, don't we? But are we thinking that, see, when you're maturing, you're thinking, all right, here it is. God's sending this to me. Am I going to do his will right now? Because my will wants to do something that's definitely against what he wants me to do. Can I get an amen for that? Amen. Oh, but I go to church all the time. I should, and, and that's good. No, it's not good. It's not good if you're not getting anything out of it. One thing we're not going to do here is play church. We come here because we're sick, and we need to be healed, and we got issues. Who doesn't have issues in this room? Why do we come to Jesus if we don't have issues? People come to church like they got it all going on. I'm saying, how can you have it all going on if you came to Jesus because you were falling apart? And the church is full of, shh, I don't want to tell anybody what's going on with me. I'm really like walking far away from God. I want everybody to think that I'm reading the Bible and know God. Yeah, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. Lies. Hypocrisy. <laughs> Instead of you coming in the church and saying, you know what? I really don't understand what God's doing in my life today, and I'm not really too happy about it. I'm getting disciplined for it. And I'd be like, yeah, join the club. Yeah. Then we could walk, take the church face off and say, wow, I struggle today. Did anybody struggle today? Yeah. Don't word and deed. I don't know about you, but this heat, when I'm warm and start to get sticky and uncomfortable, it's not a good place for me to be when people want to come up and start like picking at me. 
You know, so what do I do? I already I know my weaknesses. Make no provision for the flesh. I don't get involved in any kind of discussion that's going to bring my flesh out at that point in my time. Because it's going to only get ugly and my mouth is going to take over. Amen? That's an understanding your know, human weakness. So what do I do? I pray, Lord, please. I'm staying in this gray boot. I'm going to talk to the car for a while. And I'm going to talk to you. Because anything else is going to come out of my... If I ain't got anything good to say, I'm not going to say it. Can I get an amen for that? If you know your human weakness, you'll know when to stay out of situations that are going to bring your flesh up. That's what Christian, that's what maturity is. Understanding your weakness, not your strength. Because when you're mature enough, your weakness is, I can't do it. And then you have God kick in and say, you know what? I'm going to leave that in God's hands. I'm not going to say anything. Jesus was silent. You see how silent he was? They were coming at him with all kinds of questions and anything. And he was just, I don't have to defend myself, Jesus. You don't have to defend yourself either. Let's see if God is your ultimate attorney. Yeah. See, the problem is human beings have to defend themselves by what? With the flesh. i got to defend myself by what you said to me, but I'm going to say it back. I'm defending myself for God. No, God doesn't need you to defend him. You need him to defend you. He's your defense attorney. Amen? You know when you're in court and the lawyer's talking on your behalf? What does he tell you? He says, don't say anything. Right. Keep your mouth shut because I'm the one defending you. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Tell me about it. Now look what it says. Then your faith will go strong. See, when you... When you build your life on Jesus, your faith starts to get strong because now you're having experiences. You're, in other words, I'm walking with the Lord and I'm building my life on Him and I'm experiencing Him in my life because I'm using what He's teaching me. So I'm experiencing Jesus. I'm not just hearing about Him. I'm actually experiencing Him in my life. You know when you didn't say anything when you wanted to? That was an experience. That wasn't you. That was Jesus. That's when you glorify him. See, that wasn't me. I usually would just diarrhea would come out of my mouth in that situation. <laughs> what, helped, what held me back? Oh, that's right. Jesus did. Instead of you saying, look what I, how good I was today. Amen? People take glory for what God has given them. As Paul said, I know nothing good lives in me in my sinful nature. So... Anything aside in my sinful nature, there's nothing good there. So why would I want to glory in that? Amen? Look what it says. Your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught, and you will overflow with thankfulness. Now, how many Christians are always overflow with thankfulness? I see a lot of people coming into church like they've been sucking on lemons all day. <laughs> That is not overflowing with thankfulness when you're all bitter. Mmm. <laughs> what a bad thing it? <laughs> no, you actually had a good day because all that bad stuff that God was bringing up in your life is trying to change you. He's trying to get rid of that sinful nature in you. You should thank Him for bringing that up. But you see, that's where maturity comes in. That's something that the church doesn't even teach. What am I going to do when I leave church tonight? Am I going to go try to get other people to Jesus? Or am I going to try to become like Jesus? Look, people will know a difference without you telling them about Jesus. They'll see Jesus in you. You don't have to go getting weird. To, no, you know Jesus loves you. Yeah. That's what creeps people out. It does. It creeps people out. Instead of just acting like Jesus when a situation comes up. Then people will see something different. Amen? If your enemies are hungry, feed them. Alright. Now look what it says. Don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies. 
How many of us get captured, um, get captured with empty philosophy as believers? A lot of people get ensnared by philosophy in the world as believers. It says, don't let anyone capture you. Listen, the devil is trying to always capture people with worldly stuff and philosophies that don't come from Christ. Look what it says. It says it right here. Look what it says. In high-sounding nonsense, things that sound really spiritual, look, they come from human thinking and the spiritual powers of this world. So the Bible's telling me that there's spiritual powers of this world too. And they're not Holy Spirit powers. There's powers of darkness and evil that come off as light. So, before you accept anything from a human point of view, you always have to test it to see if it came from the Lord. Does it line up with Scripture? Are they quoting something that Jesus would quote? Or are they quoting something that the world would quote? And people get wrapped up in all this stuff, politics, and all this stuff that has nothing to do with the relationship with Jesus is what the whole Bible is designed to do, is let you walk in a relationship with him. And we get wrapped up in all that nonsense that's going on out there, and what does it do? It takes us away from God. It takes us away from knowing Jesus. Can I get an amen for that? I know, because it tried to get me. They try to get me. You know what? I'm looking at all the books in the library. I'm saying, why do I need all my books when I got all the answers right here in one book? All the answers to life's issues are in the Bible. Why I'm the way I am. Why I get angry. Why I'm jealous. Why I'm bitter. Why I'm resentful. It's called the sin nature. We fell with the sin from Adam. If the Bible explains clearly what's wrong with us. You don't have to go anywhere else to find out. The Bible tells us we all have this same nature. Some of us will hide it better than others. Can I get an amen for that? Amen. So why do I go outside? What am I called Dr. Phil? Dr. Phil, why do I act the way I do? <laughs> well, you know, that was the way you were raised. And it all goes back to when you were, you know. And I'll say, no, it all goes back to the God. <laughs> Dr. Phil. That's where it all goes back to, Doctor. Because that because the nature you're telling people they have, you have the same, same one, one, by the way. <laughs> right. Who's gonna counsel you? Right? Yeah. <laughs> people still watch it. Not, not just on no. Now look what it says. For, in, for look what it says in verse 9. For in Christ there's all the fullness of God in a human body. So you are complete through your union with Christ, who is the head of every ruler and authority. When you came to Christ, when you came to Christ, it's saying, you were circumcised. Now everybody knows what circumcision is when you're when you're born, right? The males get circumcised after eight days. That's biblical, by the way. Right? That was a physical procedure. What, remember it says in the Bible, it never changed their hearts. It was an outward procedure. Look what it says. But not by a physical procedure. Christ performed a spiritual circumcision. What was that? The cutting away of your sin nature. Ooh. Now, you ever get cut? Imagine a doctor going into you with his scalpel without you being under anesthesia. <laughs> Listen, that's what it's like when God starts to cut your sinful nature away. The only anesthesia would be the word. You trust in him. But guess what? It's painful when he cuts away our sin nature. Have you ever not noticed your sin nature, how painful it is to crucify it? He's cutting it away in every circumstance in your life. Ouch! Oh. <laughs> That hurts. I can't say that. You mean I gotta love that person? Ouch. <laughs> I gotta love my enemies? What do you mean I gotta love my enemies? I'm, I'm saved. I don't have to love it. 
What do you mean? You're saved from yourself. Of course. Look what it says. The cutting away of sin nature. You were buried with Christ when you were baptized into union with him. And with him you were raised to new life because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. Now listen what it says. You were dead because your sins and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. What it's saying, you were dead in Adam. Your sin nature was, you were dead. You were still alive, but you were spiritually dead. Now look what it says. Then, God made you alive with Christ, and he canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. Every charge you get, look, this is what people forget, that your sins have been forgiven. That's why people keep looking at their sins all the time, because they don't think that they're forgiven. Look, if you, look, if you, start, if you keep looking at your sins, you're going to keep committing them. Instead of looking at, your, at the Son, which is Jesus. God doesn't see your sins anymore. He sees His Son. Why do you keep seeing your sins instead of His Son in you? Because your sin nature is very much alive, but the Bible says He cut it away. Why is it still alive if, he said, if, if the Bible says He cut it away? I don't believe that, obviously, because I'm still operating in it. What, is it, what does it all come down to? Unbelief. That God cut my sinful nature out of me. Because it says he did it. So it says, I no longer have to live under, the, under my sin nature. I no longer have to live by its dictates, because if you do, you will die, it says in Romans 8. As a believer, I no longer have to let sin control me. Can I get an amen for that? Who okay. wants sin to control me? That's why we need a Savior. I don't want to be controlled by my sin anymore. I want to be controlled by His Son. That's what Paul was trying to say. Look what it says. Look what it says. He took it away by hands and In this way, verse 15, He disarmed the spiritual rules and authorities. All that stuff that grabs you, the spiritual rules and authorities of this world, no longer have power over you. Amen. He disarmed them. Think about that. He took all the weapons, he took all the devil's weapons and disarmed them. They no longer have control over you anymore. Now, if they still do, it's just you don't believe that they don't. That's all it comes down to is unbelief. Can I get an amen for that? Well, I don't feel like it's cut away. It's not a feeling. It's what really happened. It took place at the cross. He canceled all our sin debt. And he put our sin nature up there too. Because if he couldn't do that, that means we couldn't go to heaven. Because that's what's blocking us from being there, going to heaven. Our sins. So if I'm going to heaven, so he had to, he had to take care of it. It's done. So why am I still living in it? Why? Because I still want to. That's why. That's what it all comes down to. Because I still want to. Oh, I'm just weak. No, no, you're not weak anymore. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You're using that as a cop-out. You still want to sin. Just admit it. You're still getting enjoyment out of your sins. Can I get an amen for that one? Ouch. Either one. It all comes down to you don't believe what the Bible is saying. And that's where the spiritual growth comes in. Look. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. Look at verse 16. So don't let anyone condemn you for what you eat or drink, or for not celebrating certain holy, certain holy days or new moon ceremonies or Sabbaths. For these rules are only shadows of the reality yet to come, and Christ himself is that reality. What he's saying, all that stuff will not put you in a relationship with Jesus. Oh, I'm not going to eat steak today. It's going to get me closer to God. <laughs> uh, listen, you can you can do them things because you love Jesus, not because you have to do them. You can say, you know what, I'm gonna deny myself something that's pleasurable because Jesus denied, you know, he, he did everything for me. So I'm gonna do that for him. What the right motive? There's nothing wrong with that. But when I say, listen, I'm not eating meat today, why are you? You can't either. 
That's 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 not what it's all about. Listen, we all God doesn't make robots. If I want to say, hey, you know what? Today I want to celebrate Jesus' birthday today. What's what's the date today? August twenty first. It's Christmas for me today. I want to I want to celebrate the birth of Christ. I don't want to do it on December twenty fifth. Does it matter? No. If I want to do it today, I can I can celebrate his birth any day if I want. Well, I don't have to celebrate it at all. Because it's not even in there. Can I get any amen, fellas? Listen, it's like, it's what you are. It also comes down to the motive of my heart. In my heart, I really want to please God, Paul said in Romans 7. But because of my sinful nature, I'm a slave to it. So, it all comes down to the motive. Today, I'm going to sit. I'm tired. Today, I got up. I stepped outside. I said, oh, I know what's coming. It's going to be hot, humid. I'm going to say, well, God, God gave me this day. So what am I going to do? Complain about it or make the best of it? Or would I rather be in this right now or at 30 below in Siberia? <laughs> I think I'll take where I am right now, right? <laughs> so it all starts with that. When I, I, what had it going to my head? The word of God, being thankful for Jesus, so my day wouldn't start to go off. Because, oh no, here we go. It's going to be like this. The life's ever going to be miserable. And this, this, this. my whole day, I'd be miserable to people, be unforgiving and unlovable, snapping at my wife and snapping at everybody. But I had to make a conscious choice to be thankful for what God has given me. Can I get an amen for that? Amen. Why did I do it? Because I, I love Jesus. Not because I had to. And guess what? That was only with having this in here at the time I needed. Not just in here, but when I left the house this morning. Because the devil was up all over me. He wanted me to be a bad example today. That's what he said. He said, okay, John. I'm going to throw this one at you. 90% humidity. I know you don't like it. Traffic. Somebody that can't talk the right in, in front of me and nothing goes when it took like 15 minutes to get the order. And here it starts to come. I already see it. <laughs> right? I was thankful to God that, the, you, you know, even though it was humid, I was going to, I was grateful for God. Right? I was thankful for that. And then, what? Well, Traffic. All right, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for the traffic. Whatever. And then, <laughs> and then when I pulled into Dunkin' Donuts and I had to wait an extra 10 minutes and I'm starting to get late, and it starts to come. Right? So, in other words, the devil didn't lay off of me when I said, Oh, thank you, Jesus, for giving me a human day. He said, no, I'm going to hit you with something else now. Until I get, when you go to work, you're going to hate God. <laughs> because you know what? Because the Bible says if I hate people, that means I hate God. That's what the Bible says. How could you say you love God who you can't see when you can't love people who you can see? If you hate people who you can see, that means you hate God. Wow. That's how that's how deep it goes. And that's what the devil wants, right? You know, I used to say it all the time. I hate people. Now I gotta say, I love people. I'm like, I can't do it. I can't tell everybody I love them. No, only God can do that through me. If I allow him to. Amen. I know I can't do that because it's proof already in my life that I can't do it. Amen. <laughs> now look what it says. Look at verse 18. Don't let anyone condemn you by insisting on pious self-denial or the worship of angels, saying they've had visions about these things. Their sinful minds have made them proud of all that stuff, and they are not connected to Christ, who was the head of the body. For he holds the whole body together. See this? With its joints and ligaments. And it grows as God nourishes it. 
The world can't nourish your spiritual life. You can't get your spirit fed anywhere else, although it's going to try. But it's going to be the spirit of the flesh that gets fed, not the spirit of God. The only way you can get the spirit of God fed is through the body. And you're connected to Christ. It just says it right here. See what it says? Look what it says. And they're not connected to Christ, the head of the body, for he holds the whole body together with its joints and ligaments, and it grows as God nourishes it. Jesus says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. You can do nothing of any spiritual value apart from Christ in the church. So don't think you don't need to stay connected to a church. You definitely have to because he's the head of the church. You know it as well as I do. Deviate from gathering with people. Any of these for a while. Stop coming to church and gathering with other people and the believers. And see how far, how fast your sin nature comes back. And see how you start compromising real quick. Right? This is like strength in numbers. We need each other to strengthen each other. I don't know about you, but I need to get plugged back in after today. After the humidity and the impatience and the traffic and everything, I'm like, I can't wait. I say it at work all the time. I can't wait to go to church. They're like looking at me like, what are you, crazy kid? I say, I can't wait to go to church. They don't understand what I'm saying. They say, you're nuts. They're saying, I can't wait to go home and crack one open. I had a hard day. So I can't wait to go to church and let him crack me open. <laughs> Even Christians do that. Oh, I had a hard day. Let me go crack one open. That's not that's not Jesus. That's the spirit of the world. That's not connected to the body. No, because you go to the liquor store, it says wine and spirits. That doesn't say wine and holy spirit. Because the Holy Spirit ain't coming out after you drink that half a gallon of wine. Oh no, it's not. I'll tell you what spirit comes out all right. <laughs> and it ain't from God. How do I know? Been there, done that. <laughs> Don't work. Can't control it. You know what it does? You control it, and then slowly it controls you. That's just what sin does. You get away with sin for a little while, and you control that sin, whatever it might be, and then that sin starts to control you. And then when you don't want to do it anymore, you're trapped in it, you can't. That's right. The devil's not stupid, you know, he's sly. He lets you get away with sin for a while. So he can shut the door on you so you can't get out. And there's Christians that compromise with sin all the time. And the devil has a field day with him. I'm like, I'm all set. The devil had a field day with me enough. I no more. I'm going to Jesus. He's the go-to guy right here. Listen. I went to the devil a lot. And he never he never he, he never fulfilled his promises. He promised me life, but I was dying. He promised me that this sin would produce life in me. And it produced death in me. But it made my flesh feel good. I felt good in the moment. Can I get an amen for that? Or oh, the devil's real. And that's why we got to do studies on Satan and his trap and his tricks. And that's why we have to put the whole armor of God on. My friend gave me this point. I carry it with me to remind me that I need to put more than just what I read in the Bible today. I need to put all of God's armor on when I go out so I can resist the devil. He's coming at me from every angle because I've sold out to him. He knows exactly how to get me. And he knows exactly how to get you. <laughs> Some people love it. Look what it says. You have done what it says in verse 20. Now, now listen, I want you to believe what I'm going to tell you right now. I don't want you to feel anything. I want you to just believe what it says, okay? What it's going to say in the Bible, I want you to just believe what it says, okay? It says, you have died with Christ, and he has set you free from the spiritual powers of this world. You are free from all that stuff that controls you. 
Look what it says. So why do you keep on following the rules of the world, such as don't handle, don't taste, don't touch? Such rules are mere human teachings about things that deteriorate as we use them. These rules may seem wise, look, because they require what? Strong devotion, pious self-denial, and severe bodily discipline, but they provide no help in conquering a person's evil desires. What it's trying to say is all that upward stuff does not change what's going on inside of me. Stopping, listen, me stopping drinking and smoking doesn't stop me from being jealous. Me stopping drinking and smoking and dancing or whatever, it does not stop me from being resentful to people. It doesn't change anything inside me. Stopping all that doesn't change what's really the problem. My sin nature that lives inside of me. You have to clean, Jesus said, first clean the inside. Then the outside will come up, it'll follow. What do people do? I'm not watching that no more. I'm not going here anymore. But still in your heart, you want to. So you're doing it in the flesh. And nothing get nothing happens. Nothing changes. It's all willpower. Has no no help. Can't get any for that. Now do I say, well, you know what? Go out and tie one on because you shouldn't have to restrict yourself from that. Look, we know what it does. Look at this. Look what it does to people. It ruins lives. It doesn't. It doesn't look, it says southern comfort. There's no comfort in that. There ain't no comfort. There might be comfort for a little while in it, right? But after it's gone, you feel worse than you did before. It comes up empty, so you gotta what? Go do some more. Or maybe that's not enough after a while, so you gotta throw something else, you gotta swallow something with the southern comfort. Because it ain't working as like it used to. And then what? And then something else, and then something else. Oh, that ain't working, so I'm gonna try this now. And guess what? We never get, it never does anything. It never fulfills anything. There's only one source of comfort. Trusting in Jesus Christ. Amen. Things you can't see. Amen? Amen? So let's go to Colossians 3. So I talk about what Christians should do. Let's say what Christians should have to do. What you should do. Living the new life. So, I'm born again. The Bible says, I have a new life in Christ. Okay. Now I'm saying, live it, that new life. Whew. That's the problem. Having the new life and living the new life is the whole process of sanctification. I have a new life in Christ. The Bible says I'm free. But living it, Whew. certainly a little challenging. Isn't it challenging to live godly in an ungodly world? Can we be honest here, please, church? Can we say, yeah, it's hard? It's hard to do things of Jesus in this world with the right motive and the right attitude. Look what it says in verse 1. Since you've been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think of the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you have died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. So what does it say? It's saying, stop thinking about the stuff of the world and trying to gain more of that. Stop thinking of, look, this is just a temporary place for me. I'm just pitching a tent here. Where my real home is, in heaven, streets of gold, make you want all the mansions you want, you're going to be there. But they're not here. They're there. Worldly mansions and the mansions that God's talking about, two different kind of mansions. Now let me tell you something. I have a regular sized house. And that's hard to take care of and maintain. I couldn't maintain a mansion down here. That's a lot of work. We want, want, want all this stuff. Then you see it sitting in everybody's driveway just rotting. Boats, <laughs> motorhomes, campsites, and all this stuff that everybody, and if you start getting old and broken down, I can't take care of that no more. And it just sits there and rots away. Because it doesn't fulfill anything anymore, and you can't keep it, and it doesn't mean, you, know, you want, 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 and then you got too much stuff, and so I can't even rest. I gotta take care of all this stuff now. 
The devil is tricky. So what did I do? I said, you know what? I'm going to stop reaching for all that stuff. Although I still get trapped sometimes, to be honest with you. Because the world, we live in a society that everything you want is there. If you've got money, you can buy it. Back in their days, they lived in like a, 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 a sand hut, hut with no electricity to run in water. They may have had much choice like we have. The temptation was a lot greater for us. Can I get any amen for that? And to deny yourself in this world. Look at it says. Christ who is your life is revealed to the whole world. You'll share in his glory. When Jesus comes back, you're going to share in his glory. Just imagine. People are going to be running. And we're going to be sharing. I'm right? Yeah. Let's go, man. I'm in, that, I'm in that army with you. Now, it says in verse 5. Now, if God said that he cut away our sinful nature... I guess God doesn't lie, right? He did, right, at the cross? But why is he telling us in verse 5 that we have to put it to death now? Yep. It says, so put to death the sinful earthly things working within you. See it? Have nothing to do with sexual... So what is he saying? By him cutting away your sinful nature, he's simply giving you the power to deny all that. But he's telling us it's still coming. It's in our cell structure. Remember, this body can't inherit the kingdom. But he's telling us that I have to put it to death. Look, did I have the power to put my sin nature to death before? No. Do I have it now? Yes. That's what the resurrection is. Look, working within you have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater. Worshiping the things of this world. Because of these sins, the anger of God is coming. And it says in verse 7, you used to do these things when your life was still part of this world. See it? So if you're still doing them things, all you have to do is say, my life is still part of this world. See it? Well, you know what it says. But now is the time to get rid of anger, rage, I'm like, God, please. <laughs> Malicious behavior, slander, and dirty language. Don't lie to each other, for you stripped off your old sinful nature and all its wicked deeds. Put on your new nature, listen to this one, and be renewed as you learn to know your creator, not learn to have my creator. I have my creator when I believe in him, but now I have to learn how to get to know him. By putting all that other stuff to death is how you get to know him. Can I get an amen for that? Amen. When you're not putting that stuff to get death, right? You're not really ha having a relationship with God. You're having a relationship with your flesh. Not with Jesus. Can I get an amen for that? Amen. Now look what it says. Don't lie to each other. You stripped off your sinful nature and all the truth. Put on your new nature and be renewed as you know it. You know, as you learn to know your creator. And what does it say after that? Let's hear it. Become like him. Now, let me ask you a question. Just coming to church, are you becoming just like him? Nah, no way. Just coming to Bible study does not make you become like Christ. It gives you a lot of information that will cause that transformation if you put it into practice. But it will never happen if you don't. Can I get an amen for that? All right, we're going to stop there. So remember where we finished. We finished in verse um, 10. We, we finished, put on your new nature, be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. When we continue, we'll go to verse 11. All right, thank you for letting me share that. Listen, get to know God so be your best friend down here. Because my flesh is not my best friend. Okay? My spirit is. My spirit is my best friend now, which is the spirit of God, not the flesh. Amen? Thanks, everybody. Brittany's going to come up and sing, and we're going to close.